I actually want to talk about last, this past Monday's episode and uh, Scarlett Estevez, who plays <laughs> Trixie. She, she just breaks her heart. And these little, these little scenes, these little moments, I mean, what a tremendous child actress. Yeah, I mean, she has got the best resume out of all the cast. <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> but she, I mean, she's just incredibly, I mean, I've worked with a few child actors before, but she is so good, it's quite annoying. Uh, but she's like incredibly uh, gracious and she's, you know, she's, she's not, she's, she's not a little shit. She's like really cool. <laughs> she's really cool. She goes off and does her school and she comes back in, she knows her stuff. She takes notes brilliantly from the directors and she's just, she's, she's a, a little pro, but she's fantastic. Now she's, I think, 10 years old. What was Tom Ellis up to at age 10? Oh gosh. Well, I wasn't acting, I'll tell you that. Uh, I, I was at school, I was obsessed with sport and football, mainly, at the age of 10. Okay. Acting was uh, later, later in life for me. What well, was your first experience performing for strangers? Well, I, <laughs> weirdly, uh, <laughs> weirdly I grew up in the church, because my dad's a pastor. Um, I know. No. <laughs> I've done it, well, It gets I? better, trust me. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> So my first experience of like, you know, talking in public or, you know, performing in front of people was, would be at church because every now and again I'd be asked to like do a Bible reading or something like that. My dad would coach me, uh, you know, about how to read it and where to, you know, uh, where, to, where, where to put the emphasis and things like that. Um, so, yeah, that was, like, that was my first kind of like, you know, p performing in church, doing nativity plays, being in the church music group, everything church related. So, you know, there's a theme. <laughs> there is a theme. We'll get, into that. we'll get into that a little bit more later. What was your first paid job of any kind? Of any kind? Uh, it would have been my paper round when I was about 12. Okay. In sure. Sheffield, yeah. I had 13 houses. How many did you have? I had, uh, well, I had two paper rounds. I had a Saturday round, which is like all the, got the big Saturday supplements in it. So that was a really heavy round. There was about 30 on that. And then the regular one was about 16 papers. And what was the strangest job you've ever held? Strangest job, uh, probably the same as the most boring job as well. I once um, joined a recruitment agency and they sent me to this warehouse in Rotherham, which is just outside Sheffield. Um, I, I can't really describe it to you other than it's, it's not very nice. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this warehouse stocked parts for trucks, like literally any part of a truck was in this warehouse in like these huge containers and they, need, they needed to do an audit. So they got a group of people to come in and they'd forklift truck these things down that literally had thousands and thousands of like nuts and bolts in and we had to count them. That is tremendously boring. It was in excessively boring. <laughs> <laughs> Growing up, what did you consume more? TV, film, uh, music, stage? No, definitely. When I was growing up, I watched a lot of TV when I was growing up. Um, Any we, favorite shows you can remember? Uh, yeah, I mean, there was a uh, there was a few shows that like came over from the states that we that we would watch. <laughs> it feels weird to say this now, but we used to sit down as a family and watch the Cosby Show, um, which which feels strange now after obviously everything that's happened. But mm -hmm. that was that was uh, that was an import that we all enjoyed, uh, and. Um, we, my sisters and I would watch, you know, Roseanne we watched quite a lot of. Just crazy stuff like that. <laughs> so you got started with the acting around age 17? About 17, yeah. yeah in was in, in what way? Well, I was in high school and I, um, I was at the end of my high schooling and you have to sort of specialise in, in certain subjects. And I, I'd chosen three subjects, one of which was history, because I'd really enjoyed my previous history course. Uh, and then I wasn't enjoying it, uh, so I dropped it and I was told that I needed to take another subject and I didn't know what to do. And my old English teacher came to me and said, I run the theatre studies group. I've got 12 girls and one boy. I need more boys. And I went, 12 girls and one boy? Uh, yeah, I'm in. Yeah, so, those, those are good odds. That's, that was pretty good odds at 17. So I, that was my the wrong motivation completely to go to the theatre studies class. Um, and then I kind of just got the bug from doing theatre studies. I, I just, I really, really enjoyed it. And I've, uh, it, I, it, I found something that sort of complemented me as a person and what I enjoyed doing, I suppose. And, um, and then the more we did, the more I enjoyed it. And then basically my drama teacher from that just said, I really think you should think about doing this. So, so were you able to memorize stuff easily at that age? Did that come to you I, I easily? Don't know if it, I don't know if it's so much that, but I think it was about understanding text and just, uh, uh, just being able to sort of connect with stuff. Uh, and perform it and, and, and somehow find some element of truth. Um, and that's, you know, that's, I think that's the key to all of it, really.
You attended the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama. What did you learn about yourself during your time there? Uh, the, at the age of 18, it was probably a bit too young to go there because I enjoyed drinking more than I enjoyed <laughs> learning about theatre. Um, <laughs> There's the Scottish Academy. Yeah, the Scottish, exactly. I mean, come on, when in Rome. Um, uh, but yes, it, I, I had a really good time there, actually, because a lot of people obviously go to London, and I didn't have the money to go to London, so I had to look elsewhere. Um, and I just, I, I, I had a really good time there. I think after my first year there, I was told, you know, you need to work harder or we're going to throw you out. Um, and I also used up all my loans and everything. I just overspent. I just went, the typical 18-year-old has suddenly got bank loans and stuff. So uh, I had to go back for my 10-week hiatus, and I took on about four different jobs oh and worked about 80 hours a week to pay it all back. And that was the defining moment at which I was like, right, I need to pull my socks up, and I need to work harder. And then I went back to college and totally turned my attitude around and, uh, and got much more, much more reward for it, basically. Who was your biggest champion during this time as you found yourself as an actor? Um, there was a few people. I mean, my, my drama teacher from high school, Claire, uh, who I'm still really good friends with, um, and uh, a friend of mine's mum, who used to be an actress, who um, helped me with my audition speeches to get into the drama school, Lindy. She's still a, uh, a friend of mine. And then I guess when I was at drama school, um, the principal of the school really kind of, like, enjoyed what I did as an actor. And um, so I felt massively encouraged by him when I was there. So what was the first time you got paid to act? <laughs> I did, um, I did, in our third year at drama school, we, uh, the, there was a, so we do a, a pantomime in the UK. Now, pan, is a, is a, pantomime's like, a, it's an old-fashioned Christmas show in the UK. It's sort of a, a reimagination of a fairy tale, and there's certain set pieces that happen within a pantomime, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, we were, they, there was a panto at college, or we were allowed to go and audition for professional pantos. Uh, and I auditioned for Beauty and the Beast at this tiny little place in Kirkcaldy in, on the east coast of Scotland. And I went there and played the Beast and the Prince and uh, had six weeks off, six week off college to go and do it. With my best friend from college, James McAvoy, who also oh, <laughs> starred wow. in the panto with me as Bobby Buckfast, that well-known character. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what kind of money does one get for that? Well, age. much more than a student. Uh, I, I don't know, I was earning about probably about £400 a week or something. It was... Which is, you know, considering I, have to, I had to live off 500 pounds a term when I was there, it was, uh, mm. it was like a bit of a windfall, really. Throughout your career, what's the closest you ever came to giving up, to quitting? Um, I, will, I have to I'll, I'll preface it with the fact that I know that I've been very lucky. Like, I, a lot of my mates that I went to, to college with are, are, are not acting anymore. And a lot of people have struggled um, and just, you know, it got to a point in life where they had to make a choice. I've never gotten to that point, thankfully, but I, I did get to a point probably about two years in. I'd been working sort of solidly, and then I had, at that moment in time, what was the best job that I'd gotten, which was a, a part on a BBC drama, like a, a new six-part drama for BBC. And that, you know, it went well, uh, but when we wrapped on that show, I then didn't work for about another eight months. It was kind of weird, and then the show didn't do any more, and that was the sort of doldrums period in my in my career, and I went off to go, it was the, first, the only time I've ever had to go and supplement my acting with like another job. So I went and worked for my mum as a receptionist at a doctor's practice. <laughs> <laughs> One of the first films you did was Buffalo Soldier with Anna Paquin and uh, Joaquin Phoenix. What was your biggest takeaway from that experience? Uh, well, the, Joaquin was a really nice chap, actually. Uh, this was relative. I mean, he, 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 this was just after Gladiator, so, you know, he was still relatively new on the scene. Um, but he was a really, really cool guy, and, and he, was, he was no different to any of the other actors. Um, and I really appreciated that, because it, he didn't fall into that sort of um, star category. Um, uh, and he was very just, he was, he was just very good with people, but... It was it was a, it was sort of art imitating life that job because it was about a group of soldiers in uh, in Germany U.S. soldiers in Germany in the ninety in the sort of late eighties nineties around the Berlin Wall coming down and uh, basically they were bored out of their heads on their base because there was no war and so they all there was like a drugs racket and they all took too far too many drugs and all this and um, not saying that's what we did but uh, we uh, we were also in Germany for about two months and we like filmed maybe two days a week so it was like there was an element of boredom going on as well um, so we all amused each other now I think I read that when you ultimately saw that movie 
your American accent got redubbed? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was certainly one of the most um, humbling moments of my career. Uh, I mean, I didn't have an awful lot to do in the movie. Like, I probably had about four or five lines. This is like, this is about six months out of drama school. Uh, and I'd had to audition in American. Um, I hadn't, let's, let's just say I hadn't honed my American accent by that point in my life. Uh, no, what, what, what's the hardest thing about talking like us? I think the hard, the honest, the, the, well, this is something I sort of, I, I hit upon later in life. I did a play in London. There was a play, uh, there's a New York playwright called Nicky Silver. Do you guys know Nicky Silver? So he did a play called The Lions over here. Uh, and he, we came, he, they came over to London and we did a, a London production of it. Um, and Mark Brockow directed it. Uh, who directed it over here. And he kind of stopped, it was an all British cast, and he stopped us about two weeks into rehearsals one day, and he, he asked us all to sit down. And he said, what you're doing is you're doing an American accent. And what I need you to do is I need you to be American. And I was like, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, we are different people. We are, it's a different culture. We are front foot. We are, you know, we are, um, we're not apologetic. You know, we, we gesticulate differently, and uh, and so that was sort of it's it's spot. And I think it what one that does it rem it removed some inhibitions that a lot of British people have about just letting go, and and being all right with being American. <laughs> does that? And I, I, I'm not trying to be offensive here. No, that makes sense. Do you that know what sense. I mean? But it's like yeah. it's like take away take away you know stop thinking about that what's coming out of your mouth and start being. And it was it was it was a it was a huge light bulb for me because it was just after that play that I then got Rush, which was like my sort of big break over here, really, on the TV side of things. Right, and I remember talking to you before that premiere, and I was like, "So you can have an accent or not?" You said no, and then and uh, in a, what in the Rush premiere? And you, right, uh, I I had uh, I was American in that, yeah. yeah, yeah. Did I say I wasn't going to? See? No, no, you said you. you, you oh, said I was. You, you, I said I. W it's funny we always talk about if you're going to have an accent or not. Yes, it's about if but, I don't have an accent. Right, exactly, exactly. Your accent. There, there you go. go. That's what it is. <laughs> Which of your early TV roles do you wish had lasted longer? Uh, well, actually, the, the one I alluded to was a job called Nice Guy Eddie, which was a really sort of fun comedy drama on the BBC, and we did one season of that. Um, and then the other one, really, I have to say, is Rush. I, I really loved that job, and I, I had a... Oh, thank you. Thanks, Mum. Oh, she's here. <laughs> Um, it was so good and edgy, and you know maybe it was a little bit of. It was. Time. It was a bit. I, I think the truth is, you know, it was. Uh, it was at USA Network, and they basically. But they were trying to be edgy. They were the trying to be edgy, but there's a difference between trying to be edgy and committing to being edgy. Mm. <laughs> and I think somewhere along the line, you know, there was a bit of dilution that happened as we did the the, the series because I have to say the most rewarding part of that process was doing the pilot because it was. Uh, Jonathan Levine wrote and directed it. And if you ever get the chance to do writer-director-led projects, they're completely different to um, the sort of the general cacophony of chefs that happen on a TV show. Okay. Um, and so it, it, it was a very sort of rewarding experience. But then Jonathan wasn't involved in the series after that because he was doing a movie. And so I think various opinions started to come into the mix and then it became a sort of diluted form of what it, it could have been. Because but I still the, felt it was a decent show, and we should have got a second series. Because for the un, uh, for the uninitiated, most simply said, he was a self-medicating doctor, yeah. concierge doctor. Yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was battling all kinds of demons. He was. He had his. He had his. He had his own demons going on. But he was. A, he was a great doctor. Um, good doctor, bad habits. I think that was the tagline, wasn't it? <laughs> Miranda is a comedy. I haven't had a chance to catch it yet, but it's kind of a cult hit, and it's kind of making its way over here on YouTube and stuff. Yeah. What was that all about? Um, so uh, there's a, a comedian in the UK called Miranda Hart, who's now incredibly famous as a result of the show. But, right. but um, in, I think, 2008, um, she was well-known-ish on the comedy circuit, but not certainly not um, in the public eye. Um, and she'd written this pilot called Miranda Hart's Joke Shop. Um, and I got, I got sent it, and uh, I quite honestly did not know whether it was funny or not after I read it. I just couldn't quite get my head around it. But there were sort of bizarre and funny moments in it, but I didn't know how, I, I had no sort of conception of it. Anyway, I went to the uh, audition, and, I, and Miranda was there, and I, she'd written it, and we, we were able to talk about it. And then we, she, she was like, shall we give it a read? And as soon as we started reading it, I'm like, oh my God, this is hilarious. Because of her, because of her delivery, she's just a very unique performer. And, and once I got my head into that, like, it became, 
uh, it became it, it became funny, um, and we we did the pilot. But again, all the time I was thinking, are people going to find this funny? I know I find this funny, but I don't know if people are. I, we did the pilot, and then the, the BBC picked up the first series of it, and we did it on BBC Two as a tiny little show, mm. um, and it just became huge overnight. It was really weird. It got huge viewing figures for BBC Two, and then they moved it to BBC One. Um, we did two seasons really quickly, one after the other, and then I think the third season uh, premiered on like Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, and we got like nearly 15 million viewers. Oh my god! Which in the UK, in the that's UK, almost like yeah. one in three people, which is crazy. <laughs> Um, so it, it, it just, yeah, it was something that really snowballed and, and has had a huge effect on my career over there. Yeah, I was watching a scene on YouTube this morning, and I get your play, you play a bartender, and Miranda's talking to you, and she, there's just something about her delivery. I feel like your character can just barely keep it from busting out laughing. Yeah, if it's, this, if it's the scene, I think. I probably was busting out laughing. Um, yeah, I mean, she... I, I, we like to push it because it was a live audience as well, so we'd rehearse for four days, and then we'd take it into the studio and do it in front of a live audience. Um, which is, you know, rewarding process. Uh, but she, she is one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life, and she would push it and push it and push it. And if she knew the audience, because also the, the conceit was that she broke the fourth wall. You know, she would turn stuff out to camera at home, um, mm -hmm. and we, you know that was a, that was a sort of very nice feature of uh, of what the show was that she was sharing her sort of confusion with people and her kind of like <laughs> I can't believe I just said that moments. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was a big, it was a big part of my life, that show. Next week is Upfront's week here, and, uh, that's when the networks all come to town. They each take a day to try out their new shows, announce which shows are coming back. And it's, you know, that's when we find out when a lot of pilots, if they've gotten picked up or not. Tell us what pilot season is like for an actor. Um, ironically, it's like hell. Uh, it's... I mean, it's, it's one as a, as, a, as a Brit coming over for the first time when I started doing the, the whole pilot thing. I mean, it's just it just doesn't work like that at home. It's a, it's a completely different thing. First of all, when does it start? Like February, January? It starts a, yeah. It starts roughly around the end of January and goes through February into early March. Most things have to be in production by the end of March into April to then get turned around at a ridiculous rate to then be ready to present to the networks. And they have to make their decisions by th this time in May, basically. But they, I mean, they leave it. There are still some people who don't know if they've been picked up or not, I think. Mm -hmm. um, they leave it till the very, very last minute. And it's just, I mean, there's so many different elements to pilot season. The, the humiliation of the cattle call, um, you know, coming over. I, I kind of like, it was strange for me coming over because I'd sort of made headway at home in my career. And then coming over, it just felt like I was starting again. Um, but then you just have to get your head around that, and you really just have to back yourself and, and do your work is the main thing I would say about pilot season. Work really hard. Make sure you're on top of stuff as much as you can be because it does make a difference. Because like two, two and change years ago when you signed on for Lucifer, how many scripts had you looked at during that pilot that, season? That pilot season, I had... Uh, I'd been sent probably about 15 scripts that had already sort of my my um, my agents had sort of vetted through stuff that they thought I would and wouldn't like, um, and they presented me with like fifteen scripts. And uh, I mean, there was a, there was one thing that I was really sort of that I really wanted to do. I mean, it's so funny when you look back because often these things never see the light of day again. You've got God, I really wanted that job, and then it never happened. Um, but uh, and then the, the Lucifer script, sort of, I was actually I actually read it at JFK Airport. Um, I was on my way back from meeting Sarah Silverman here, um, which was the job that I really wanted at that moment in time. Also, I thought she was doing this pilot for HBO. Um, and, uh, and then I found out on the way back to JFK that that wasn't going any further. So I was a bit like crestfallen. Oh, I fucking hate pilot season. Uh, and then I got, like, I got to the airport and I went into my bag and I pulled out the next script to read, the next thing to get excited about. And it was Lucifer and I was like, oh, for goodness sake. All right, let's read it. So I, but literally by about page three, I was like, oh my God, this is really funny. Yeah. And it was a whole, like, it was just, it just popped because it was so different to everything else I've been reading. And that's, that's got, what got me excited. I've spoken about this with like Anna Torv, Ivan Strahovski. Uh, over the past 10 years, like Hollywood's really enjoyed this kind of, what I affectionately call like a British invasion. <laughs> a lot of uh, actor, you know, English actors, Australian, Welsh, They've come over and you know filled a lot of roles. Uh, is that just because the job market's so much better here? 
Um, I think there's a few reasons. I think obviously there's a lot more stuff. There's a lot, you know, there's so much scripted drama because of just all the cable derivatives yeah, and, there and everything. 454 scripted shows last year. There you go. I mean, that's that, uh, that's unbelievable. It's a lot of jobs. Uh, it's a lot of jobs. Um, it's also a lot of shit. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's so there's that. There's that going for it. But I think you know, obviously, people coming over and doing well inspires other people to do that. Um, and I have to say, you know, I, not that I necessarily buy into this, but a lot of people, you know, when I come uh, to work over here, talk about, you know, that, that, that they hold British actors. And I have to say, they, uh, in LA, they talk about New York actors. They talk about New York actors and mm. British actors and Australian actors <laughs> and then the LA actors. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems that everyone thinks that the New York actors and the British actors are, you know, much more cultured. Um, it's a craft for them, you know, and they are real actors. Um, and I think that that's, that's sort, of a, a, a sort of a gen, you know, it's a very generic attitude to adopt. But I think there is that kind of like thing that people think we're a bit better. And I'm like, mm, not, <laughs> not, not, not necessarily. <laughs> Um, but I think it, I don't know. It's 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 a, a strange. I'm willing to ride that train if people want to do it. But yeah, yeah. I think um, I think more than anything, it's you know if your peers are doing well because it used to when I you know LA and pilot season and whatever only a, a smattering of people when I first started would go would go over and do it and even less would get success from doing it. You'd hear a lot about the, the pilot season graveyard and and that would, was enough to turn most people off. But I think now it's just kind of steamrolling because people are going, why not? Why not? So you get the Lucifer role. What was most important to you? What were you most mindful of when shaping this character, this performance? I mean, you're playing the devil. <laughs> I know. I, well, the, weirdly, I didn't want to put too much weight on that particular aspect of it because that's not, that wasn't like my, my focal point. Like that was a sort of, that was a hook for sure. But um, it was so, I mean, Tom Kapanos wrote the pilot script, the original pilot script that I wrote, that I, that I read. And, um, you know, he'd written this this character so he'd imagined this character on the page for me. That's what I felt like. I felt like I was reading a blueprint. I didn't really. It was very instinctive my choices for it because of what was in front of me, um, and so I wanted to kind of honour that. And I think, you know, I worked through it with a friend of mine. Um, we sort of act coach each other when we've got auditions, and it's, which is really helpful, by the way. Um, and uh, we were talking about, you know, what what this what was needed for this particular character and what what we'd got on the page. And I think a lot of it was about, you know, uh, speed of delivery, because it was written in this very sort of particular meter, and it, mm -hmm. it really reminded me of like, um, you know, a, 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 like an Oscar Wilde play or an old coward play when it's very sort of, it relies on a particular rhythm for something to work for a character. So, you know, I honed in on that and then just a kind of like, he had this kind of swagger about him. And so I sort of wanted to get this kind of rock and roll swagger going on. Um, so I just, you know, listened to a lot of Rolling Stones and read some Noel Coward and that was it. <laughs> Now, when Lucifer sings on the show, and he sings, you know, every now and then, that's actually you. Is yeah. that something the producers knew they were getting, or is that just a free upgrade? That, that, that was a result of a, of a karaoke night out with all the cast and producers. <laughs> After, I can't, I, I think we'd, we'd done the pilot, and we were in L.A., and I can't remember what was happening, but basically we ended up out singing. Um, and Joe and Ildi, or our showrunners, were like, we didn't know that you could sing. And, uh, we we're, were toying with the idea of putting it into the show because one of the things that you know was big about Lucifer in the pilot and when I was sort of researching Lucifer his, was his love of music um, and um, and music's a great leveler as well so you know it's a, it's something that he connects with I don't know that he knows that he connects with the emotion of it when it's happening but uh, yeah so so basically they they wrote it into like I think it was episode six of the first season. Uh, to do this Nina Simone mm -hmm. Cinnamon cover, and then there's been a few you know, bits dotted along the way. But we can't, we can't overdo it, because no, no. people will turn off. Now, you said, of course, your father is a pastor, and your uncle is a pastor, yeah. and your sister is a pastor. Mm -hmm. You said, uh, I know, <laughs> you said they actually get a kick out of knowing that you're playing Lucifer uh, on TV. Do they ever give you notes like, that was, that was a cool little theological bit they threw in, or...? Uh, no. <laughs> No, um, 
I, uh, they, uh, they, I don't think they, you know, my dad's seen the pilot of this show. I don't think, like, it's kind of, and not because it's about the devil, but I just don't think it's my dad's kind of show. Okay. Um, uh, and my parents have always been quietly supportive. They watch a few, a few things that I've done, but they don't always, if, they, if it's not their cup of tea, they won't watch it. Um, but they, they, you know, my dad watched it and it was, um, you know, I, I was talking to him about this one million mums thing that happened. Do you know about this? Mm -hmm. Before, before the show came out, before the, the, uh, before we even aired, I think, there was a whole online petition to try and get the show banned by one million mums, yeah. who are a lovely bunch. Uh, and uh, because it was about the devil. Um, and, but they hadn't seen it, which was what made me laugh even more. It was like, that says more about you than it does about our show, I think. Um, but, you know, my dad, it was great, my dad watching it, because he was like, what are these people on about? <laughs> Because <laughs> it was just, you know, it's just, it's, it's just fun, and it's taking a, you know, a fictional character from a comic book, which is what we've done, and we've not, we, we never talked about the big book when we were doing this, um, and and using it to tell a story, um, and I don't think the heart, the message of that story is too bad, which is that anyone deserves redemption. Very good. I want to get to a couple audience questions before we finish up here. Roberta wants to know, what is the best thing about playing the devil? <laughs> is that you? <laughs> um, the best thing about playing the devil, um, if I get to wear lots of nice suits, and I get to drive a really nice car, <laughs> uh, and I get to say what I want to whoever I want. Um, in this particular job, though, I get a lot of um, free reign from the producers, so I get to kind of like improvise a bit, and that's not always the case on the TV set, so that's quite fun. Steve wants to know, will Lucifer and the, I believe the word is lovely, will Lucifer and the lovely detective ever get it on? <laughs> well, they almost did, uh, until he they've found out. They've come so close. They've come so close. Um, I, I, I would imagine so, but if, if this show is going to have any longevity, <laughs> um, it would be wise to keep that, you know, keep that tension going. Um, you know, we, we always thought there was, was always a question on Miranda as well, but I think any sort of successful long-running TV show that has a kind of like, will they, won't they at the center of it, it needs to be will they, won't they, otherwise it's like, oh, they did. <laughs> End of the show. Um, so, yeah. What, uh, the, the best advice I've ever gotten from a coworker or a supervisor was, only do the things that only you can do. What's the best advice you've ever gotten in your career as an actor? Uh, Mark Strong, uh, the actor Mark Strong, do you know Mark Strong? He's a very wise man. <laughs> uh, he said to me one day, just know what you're in and don't fight it. And I think that, that, that was, it sort of took me a while to digest that, but it's like, yeah, that's a really good point. And it sort of alludes to the fact, you, you've got to work with what you've got. Um, you know, if you sign yourself up to do a job and that is the script, then that is the script. There's no point fighting and crying about this doesn't work, that doesn't work. You find a way and you don't fight it, and tonally, you know, I could give myself a hard time about this show because it's silly and it's fun, and, you know, I'm maybe not, like, you know, doing uh, a gritty piece of drama for the next few years or whatever, but I'm not fighting it because I know what I'm in, and, and I'm really enjoying the ride, and it's like, you know, I know that I've got other, you know, uh, other bows in my armor, other like arrows in my armor. I can't. I was trying to do some kind of like archery sort of <laughs> metaphor, and it didn't work. But you did play Robin Hood. Uh, yeah, yeah, just once, and that was why. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, there are more strings to my bow, as it were. And uh, but and I'm I'm comfortable with that. And I think you know, if you if you know what you're in and you don't fight it, then you can do the best job with what you've got. What's your number one audition tip? Work really hard. Like, like, work really hard. Uh, there's no... I, I'd like to walk into an audition thinking this is how I would do it on the day if I was asked to come in on set. So just make some choices, go with those choices, and then, you know, if someone wants to direct you, they can direct you. But you just commit to making some choices. You have three daughters. Have any of them expressed an interest in acting? And how, uh, how, how would Dad react? Oh, I would be, I would be cool about it, I think. I mean... I mean, unless they were awful. <laughs> and I think that's the catch-22, isn't it? If they're really bad, you have to go, this is a really tough industry, and just, just don't. <laughs> but, um, I mean, if they were good... I mean, my, elder, my eldest daughter, actually, my eldest daughter just got a scholarship to a school because she's a great singer. Um, and so, you know, obviously I would encourage her to pursue that because I think, why not? You know, I was encouraged to do it, and I'm doing it now, so why not? All right, very good. 
think we're all set. Thanks. Thank you, Tom.